Hi, I'm here today to talk about sports, technology, and culture, but don't worry, there won't be too much sports in it. <laughs> so my name is Mark Kornblatt. I'm the CEO of the Aerial Sports League, one of the world's oldest and first drone sports organizations. I'm also the co-founder of the Museum of Future Sports, and believe it or not, I'm not a sports fan. I grew up in a sports-oriented family, and while my brothers were all off playing football and Little League and you know, watching uh, sports on TV, I was more interested in things like Evil Knievel, The Bionic Man, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, um, uh, uh, Harry Houdini. And I actually um, went to school at, uh, in high school. I was a dance major at Baltimore School for the Arts. I went to NYU and got a degree in film and video technology in the late 80s. And more recently, I got a master's degree from SF State in conceptual information art. In the late 90s, or early 90s actually, I created Sparky, which was a two-way telepresence video chat robot. It really predated the internet by a number of years and was essentially an ultimate expression of uh, analog technology to a large extent, um, and what I thought of as uh, the Industrial Revolution and kind of the uh, expression of that. Uh, I spent about 10 years wandering the desert as water boy. And uh, basically, in my entire life, I've identified as an artist, as an inventor, a creative uh, media producer. And most recently, uh, in the last seven or eight, nine years, I found myself promoting this idea of future sports. Now, all of life really comes down to the idea of competition for resources, uh, eat or be eaten, survival of the fittest, and this is kind of in the DNA of all living creatures. And when human beings first uh, started uh, formulating societies, the idea of play and competition really was integral to a lot of these uh, uh, cultural uh, environments. Uh, there are some examples, like the Roman Colosseum, where the sports were considered uh, entertainments for the masses. But in a lot of these prehistorical cultures, sports and, uh, sports and competition wasn't really separated. It's not like you worked in the field, then you went to church, and then you played sports. In many ways, these activities were integral to the society and the culture in which they were reflected. And so early sports really does reflect the time, culture, and the technologies of those times and places. When we think about modern sports, football, basketball, auto racing. I consider these to be essentially analog sports. And if you think about the origins of where they've come from, many of these come from the turn of the century during the Industrial Revolution. And just like those earlier cultures, these sporting activities are a result and a reflection of the technologies, the societal upheavals, and cultural changes that are occurring. And so when we look forward and we think about the idea of future sports, it's the same. These new games, sports, and competitions are fueled by today's upheavals in culture, technology, and society. And so what we're looking at now in terms of sporting activities has, in some ways, a very different uh, look and feel from those traditional sports. They're very much uh, informed and infused with technology. Technology isn't just there to support the, the sport and the game. It's actually integral at the heart and soul and in the base of a lot of these activities. And so what we're seeing is a really different way in which the audiences can engage with the professionals, how audience members can actually, spectators can become professionals. And we see an interesting level playing field that we never really saw in traditional analog sports. And while the future sports world of video games and drone racing is far from a perfect environment, it does create this kind of level playing field by which anybody can excel. You don't have to have a linebacker's body or a swimmer's body or a gymnast body, you can be young or old. It, it's really, a, in some ways, a, an incredible level playing field. And a perfect example of that is this young woman here in the corner who actually, she's a, an 11-year-old girl from, I believe, somewhere in Southeast Asia. I wish I could remember the details. But she is currently one of the highest ranked professional drone racing uh, pilots in the world. She's only been flying or racing professionally for a year or two, but anywhere that she shows up at a competition, she inevitably is at the top of the podium. And it's a great example to see her racing against people two and three times her age and just wiping the floor with them. Um, and she's not an anomaly. She is not an exception. Across all this spectrum of what we considered uh, uh, future sports, the younger you are and the younger you get exposed to it, the more likely you can be a champion at that young age. So 
a brief history of uh, timeline, if you will, of future sports. And by no means am I truly an expert in this. I just pretend to be one in my industry. And so there's a lot of information here that's personal. <laughs> um, there's a lot of missing pieces to the puzzle here, but I, I hope to give you a brief kind of overview of how we've gotten from these ancient cultures to where we are now. And like so many interesting stories about technology, this one begins with Nikola Tesla, who in 1898 created what was essentially the first remote control toy. In this case, it was an electrically powered boat, and it was controlled remotely through radio waves. And if you think about the time and place in which he did that, most of those technologies seemed almost more like magic. Um, but I like to think that in so many ways that he inf uh, infused our modern culture that in the world of games and sports, he actually had a, a large hand to play in that as well. And throughout the Industrial Revolution, electronics, uh, electricity and um, mechanization uh, informed a lot of sports and games. And so you see things like these tethered electric race cars where, where drivers would literally have the cars on the end of strings and they'd race in these oval tracks and control the car through, through, through a, a, a string, an electrically powered string. As uh, transistorization and miniaturization occurred through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the idea of radio-controlled devices was really available to just about anybody. And so throughout the country, and in fact throughout the world, you see communities sprouting up with professionals and amateurs meeting using RC cars, RC airplanes, and all kinds of uh, toys and devices, and actually forming not just communities, but professional organizations and, and leagues. Now, a lot of people look to the 70s and the beginning of the video game era as the start of the era of future sports, and in many ways, they would not be wrong. Uh, Nolan Bushnell and Atari and the advancements that occurred then really changed the perception for so many people between a pre-digital and a and a digital world. And so it can't be understated the amazing influence that video game culture and technology has had from that era of the 70s through to today. And uh, even before the internet was really working, there were LAN parties when people wanted to play multi multiplayer games together. They would take their PCs, bring them to some kid's parents' basement, make a local area network, and, and video game and play all weekend long. It's worth pointing out that even though now with esports being a huge industry, LAN parties are still incredibly popular. Just recently, we went to uh, DreamHack in Denver, which had hundreds of thousands of spectators there to watch professional video gamers play. But in the basement, there was a room with literally 3,000 people who had dragged their PCs across the country to set them up and to play multiplayer games together, and they weren't even watching what the pros were doing on the main stage. I look at robot combat as a really interesting piece of technology that in some ways reflects the ultimate expression of the Industrial Revolution, but because of its time and place that, that we were introduced to it in the 80s on Comedy Central and, and now uh, throughout culture, it really, I think, reflects a way in which we're looking forward and how technology being in the hands of everyday people went from being the powers of industry to being the powers of gaming and uh, competition. As we look into the current uh, 21st century, the rise of esports has really been astounding. And most people nowadays are starting to understand and un hear about what esports really is, but most people don't realize that as an industry, the size in total is actually much larger than, say, the uh, NFL and NASCAR and even the music industry combined. It's, uh, it's not unusual for there to be an esports event that most people in the public never hear about yet it can have hundreds of thousands of spectators there live watching, and they can have dozens of millions of dollars in prize money. And these are not exceptional events, these are becoming commonplace events. Esports is really becoming a dominant force in our, uh, in our daily lives and our culture in every way. And in no small part, that's been fueled by the rise of social media, not just networking, but social media, which has allowed affinity groups to find each other, allowing experts to share their knowledge, allowing promotion and competitions. And we've had teams of racers show up at an event of ours who never met in person, but online, racing in simulators and practicing together, they come to an event of ours, and as a team, they're ready to go. It's pretty astounding. In our industry specifically, those technologies really informed uh, the world of drone sports. In 2011, some friends of mine bought uh, cheap um, drones from Brookstone, and the first thing we did was smash them together. And the second thing we did was pick up all those broken parts, and we used to joke that we would have five minutes of flying and then five weeks of repair time. 
We actually decided to uh, DIY some solutions and build a better mousetrap. And our goal was to build an indestructible drone. And we shared a, videos on YouTube of our DIY progress. Um, we were getting better and better at it and getting a following. In fact, one of our videos shows us running the drone over with a car, hitting it repeatedly with a baseball bat, flying it through fire, and even shooting it with a shotgun. Um, and so people wanted this drone, even though we just had the one sample. So we took advantage of the, the technologies. We did a Kickstarter. It was pretty successful. We got the word out there, and we were able to raise some money to develop our idea further. But really what happened was we created a community. And then leveraging another technology meetup, we actually started having weekly and monthly meetups here in the Bay Area that were huge. Um, and an uh, uh, international community online that was even bigger. Um, those technologies allowed this kind of weird, artistic, drone combat activity of friends of ours to basically turn into like an internationally recognized uh, passion for so many people. And as other technologies like the wireless video systems for drone racing came on board, the, the, the industry just completely exploded, and in no small part to the way in which these industries are connected to social media. So in the future sports timeline, nowadays people have access to all kinds of technologies. So we see things like the megabots, which are giant mechas fighting each other. Um, there's been art battles for a while. I remember painting battles and even some Photoshop art battles happening. But recently, uh, Oculus was uh, promoting this uh, VR sculpture battle, which I think is fantastic. As an artist, I was never really a fan of competitive art projects or the, like the reality TV shows that were creative. I always thought that that was a mismatch. And even in the world of uh, robot combat, I never really wanted my like, creative work to be so destroyed. Um, but I love the idea of, of this um, virtual reality art battles because it puts the A in STEAM and really allows that notion of STEM to be STEAM. And in our world of uh, sports and competition, we're always looking for that kind of fun gaming way in. And, and the VR art battle to me is just a, hits a real sweet spot. And this is about where we are in the timeline, but the timeline really isn't done. Uh, this summer, uh, Lockheed Martin is producing Alpha Pilot, which is actually where sort of AI and generative uh, coding starts to come into play. Alpha Pilot is going to be a drone race, but there's no pilot. It's an AI drone competition. So pilots and engineers and technicians will work together, but when the race starts, the pilot is out of the picture. The same thing with the AI robo race. They're taking Formula One cars, electrically powered Formula One cars, and they're removing the driver. And they're racing on the same circuits that drivers have been racing on for decades. And these cars are just as fast and just as capable. And although this is just now beginning to emerge, these cars are already capable of doing things that human drivers would struggle an entire career to be able to do. And so the writing on the wall that AI is going to be a big part of future sports seems pretty bright. I love some of these other things that are happening. The Exosuit Racing League. It may be hard to tell, but that's a four-legged robot with a human in the middle. Think of it kind of like a monster truck, but instead of four big rubber tires, it's got four legs. And the operator, the driver in the middle of it, has got all these controls, and he's frantically trying to drive this thing faster than his competitors. And I think that's just great. There's a number of uh, viable, realistic jetpacks. They're no longer science fiction anymore, and people are developing some really compelling jetpack technology. So the very first thing they do once they solve that problem <laughs> is race. And I'm really excited to see jetpack racing. And so looking forward, it's not hard to imagine other ways in which technology is going to infuse sports. America loves football, but we all acknowledge that it's doing a lot of brain damage to people in all sorts of different ways, and we're scared to let our kids play now. And that makes sense. Robots nowadays are so agile and so capable. Uh, in, in the world of special effects, they're using robots to replace people in practical effects because they're able to move and be so agile. So it's not hard to imagine teams of football players made entirely out of robots. And while I don't watch football, I would watch that. To me, that's really interesting. <laughs> and you know, we keep talking about space tourism as the next big frontier, and I'm really excited about that. Whenever I talk to people about that, one of the first things that comes up is playing games in zero gravity. And you, know, you can talk about the inaccessibility of what that means to the common person, and there's certainly truth to that, but I can only hope that I'm alive long enough to be able to go and experience this myself. So this is a list of some future sports that all exist right now. 
Some of these are more, barely more than a glimmer in the eye of their creators. One or two of these represent some of the biggest entertainment concerns on the planet. The spectrum is incredible and it's wide, and all of them are being inf informed by the culture of today, the technology, and our society changes. So just like any other activity, there's a lot of similarities between future sports and traditional analog sports. The notion of uh, camaraderie and teamwork and community is really strong. That desire for competition is always there. Humans love war and blood and destruction, and whether it's the gladiatorial games in the Roman arena or whether it's football today, there's something appealing to a number of people about that, and future sports doesn't deny that. Robot combat, drone combat, these things tap into that same primal urge, but they're doing it in a very different way where, again, the intellectual STEM subject matter has to be in place. And this final similarity is actually most interesting to me personally, which is about flow state, about uh, extreme athletes getting in the zone or being uh, in that out-of-body experience. Uh, musicians talk about it all the time, uh, athletes do. In fact, a lot of people that I talk to, regardless of what they do, they talk about that cascade of brain chemicals, that flow state, even if they're scrubbing their bathroom. It can happen any time and place, but uh, athletes in particular talk about it as a real motivator and driving force. And future sports are no different. They, um, they're all about that flow state idea, but because of the technologies that we're using, actually the, the access to flow state uh, is one of the main differences that we see because we're mediating our experiences with technology, with VR goggles, with wireless video goggles, and all sorts of other technologies, we're able to tap into that flow state in a way that earlier generations just didn't have the same access. If you wanted to jump out of an airplane or bungee jump or go skiing, there's risk and there's time and there's uh, logistics involved in that. But if you want flow state as a drone racing pilot, you just need to go out to a field with a bunch of batteries and you can have five minute session after session after session all day long. And the idea that you can be essentially maintaining flow state that intensely is really amazing. And the technologies give us almost like a main line to flow state. And a part of that is because of the way that simulation and reality are starting to mix and uh, be, get remixed in, in future sports. In the world of drone sports, we're trying to figure out ways to get that goggle experience that the pilots have to the audience. And in doing so, we're really deconstructing what that means. So we're working on games where it would be team-based multiplayer drone sports where the pilots have one type of experience of the game through their goggles. The live uh, spectator audience may have a different experience altogether through augmented reality and maybe even ways to participate. And then the spectators who are at home or watching through streaming have yet a third way of interacting and engaging. And so the idea that a single sport can be remixed and providing a wide range of experiences is again something new that hasn't really been seen in traditional analog sports. And as I mentioned before, uh, future sports tend to offer a remarkable level playing field. It's far from perfect. There's tons of bro culture in here and famously Gamergate has been a problem within the world of video games. And those problems are not necessarily going away, but they're being addressed. And compared to a lot of the traditional uh, sports or activities or opportunities, there's tools that allow people to really uh, stand up for themselves, compete, and, and be competitive where that level playing field really wasn't quite the same previously. Now, the one major difference, and this is actually, I think, the, the big problem that's emerging in the world of uh, video games and esports and, and future sports, is a lack of access the haves and the have-nots. None of this future sports stuff happens by accident. You don't just run out during recess and create video games in the schoolyard. You have to have access to tools, technology, and education. And quite frankly, that's missing for a lot of people. Here in San Francisco, we find that to be especially acute when we have these massive unicorns, these startups that are worth billions of dollars, bringing tons of really great, well-paying jobs into the city or into the Bay Area. And a lot of the kids who live here in the shadow of these megaliths don't have access to that technology. They don't have the resources, their schools don't have the resources, and they're really being left out. And this problem, in, in one sense, to me, is actually an opportunity. And when we're looking forward, 
my partner and I, uh, Douglas, we decided that we didn't want to just provide this, infra this uh, umbrella idea and this community for the, uh, the players. We really wanted to be able to reach out and we learned through our early STEM education uh, activities and programs that <clears throat> these, <clears throat> these uh, technologies are like the Pied Piper. We've seen so many kids who, I'm not gonna learn, I hate school, I'm gonna act out. But then when they see us come in with the drones and they see what we're doing with them and they wanna have an opportunity to do it, not only do they calm down and, and sort of behave and really uh, independently start learning everything they need around these technologies, but it seems that sometimes that the hardest cases end up being not only the best at the sport or the skill, they actually become teachers to their peers. And so it's really remarkable what we've seen these Pied Piper-like technologies offer. So my partner and I, we started the Museum of Future Sports. It's a 501c3, and education and STEAM education is the foundation uh, of what we're trying to accomplish as we reach out to all these different communities and demographics. We're actually fortunate enough to have a, a pop-up this summer here in San Francisco, 100,000 square feet right downtown on Market Street. And we're gonna be offering STEM, STEAM education during the day. At night, we're gonna be open to these communities for meetups, we're gonna have paid events, we're gonna have nightclub sort of events where it's all about future sports instead of about you know, bands or, or DJs. Um, and we're even hopefully gonna open it up as a ticketed uh, activity for people who want to just come in, learn, get their hands dirty uh, playing with all of these activities. So we've partnered with the uh, Mayor's Office of Workforce Development and Opportunities for All, which is a summer program giving high school kids uh, paying summer jobs. We're gonna train those high school kids to be STEM educators. Um, we're also working with the Human Rights Commission and about a dozen local CBOs and local organizations to, um, to, to launch this and create this umbrella concept that not only pulls in all these communities of the haves, but really reaches out to all the have-nots as well. And we've considered that to be kind of our mission in bridging that tech divide. And so I'd like to uh, show you a, a quick video of really what was meant as an internal uh, video sketch, if you will, for my team and I to share what we hope this uh, summer uh, pop-up will, will be like. And um, so please enjoy. <laughs> Now, I've been asked to do a, a quick demo of the drone FPV, but I can also do a Q&A at the same time, so if you just give me a minute, I'll get the drone up in there. <laughs> um, oh, there we are, okay, great. And uh, this is the drone right here. This is like the new breed of drone. It's, uh, it's lightweight, it's so light and small that it's not even considered a drone by the FAA. And so a lot of the professionals are turning to this just because it makes life a lot easier. You can fly these with a lot less uh, risk, there's no real danger of these hurting anybody. And the experience through the goggle is the same as if you're flying the pro big professional drones as well. And so we've seen drone races based around this technology with thousands and thousands of dollars in prize money and international uh, island communities. How much does that drone cost? How much for the drone? Yeah. This drone right here is about $100 roughly. And if you wanted a kit with the goggles, the radio and the drone, that still can come in at about $175. 
A few years ago, it was multiple hundreds. But there's a race to the bottom for the cost of these technologies. And quite frankly, they're pretty much available to anybody who wants them. Imagine if I was a good pilot. <laughs> Do you need help this summer? <laughs> yes, we do. In fact, thank you for asking that. We were actually looking for helpers, collaborators, volunteers. We want to make our space to be as immersive and as engaging as possible. And so we love the idea of bringing in music technology, art technology. We would love to see uh, uh, advisors and mentors and people from different uh, tech companies, especially some of those unicorns I mentioned, really helping, reaching out and trying to engage with these communities of kids along with us. Um, so please feel free to get in touch with me after I land. And we can discuss that. <laughs> This drone is uh, called Tiny Hawk. It's made by a brand uh, called Emacs. And it's part of a, uh, a genre of drones uh, called Tiny Wolf. And that's really uh, this micro drone format that you see that's using the smallest possible battery, the smallest amount of mass, and still creating these professional uh, grade experiences. So that world is called Tiny Wolf. This is called the Tiny Hawk. Any other questions? One mic. There we go. Could you tell us a little more about Waterman? About Waterboy? Waterboy, yeah. Sure. All right, I'll go back to So um, I started going to Burning Man in 98. And I wanted to just do the craziest thing I could do. And so I thought scuba diving in the desert is about as crazy as could be. <laughs> I turned to a number of uh, professionals who had worked on these kinds of vinyl suits and, and things before, mostly out of Hollywood. And without exception, everyone said, you can't do it, the uh, physical dynamics of the suit, the, they won't hold water, and you're probably going to drown. Um, but I found a local uh, leather maker who understood materials really well, and he was a friend of mine. He was actually the guy who encouraged me to go to Burning Man. And we figured it out. We figured out how to hold you know, a couple hundred gallons of water in this vinyl suit and then get inside of it so it's like a very wet suit and, and have scuba gear. So I'm underwater. The water level is here, but I'm completely underwater. And let me tell you, that's the best place to be at Burning Man. <laughs> and so after a couple of years of doing that full body suit, we uh, actually adapted a more portable version, which we called Bubblehead or Buckethead. And it was literally a, a, a tight rubber gasket around the neck and a globe, a plastic globe or sphere filled with water. And so my body is now completely dry and out of the water, but my head is submerged and I'm snorkeling inside of it. Um, and so that, that, was, my, uh, that was my desert work. <laughs> 